Welcome to the Orgasmic Lifestyle Podcast by Venus O'Hara. I'm here to welcome you into the world of orgasmic living by hosting experts to discuss orgasmic topics such as nutrition, spirituality, personal development, sexuality, and much more. Here, we will offer lifestyle lessons that can help you lead a fulfilling, joyous, and orgasmic lifestyle. I'm your guide, Venus O'Hara. Welcome to the 48th episode of the Orgasmic Lifestyle Podcast by Venus O'Hara. In this New Moon episode, I'll be discussing International Masturbation Month, and we'll be speaking with Chad Braverman, the COO of Doc Johnson, the world's number one adult toy manufacturer. Then I'll be discussing the book I'm reading now, which is Forever by Judy Bloom. And finally, we'll be experiencing a guided meditation with affirmations for masturbation as an act of self-love. But first, let me share with you some reflections on masturbation and sex education. It's International Masturbation Month. When I first heard about this on social media, because I'm in the masturbation industry, I just thought it was another thing just to promote masturbation, sell more sex toys. I didn't really think anything of it because there are many, you know, National Day of this, of that. And then and I guess these days are created to to raise awareness about certain topics. I didn't think there was a kind of deeper meaning to it, though. But when I looked up on Wikipedia, this is what I found. International Masturbation Day is an annual event held to protect and celebrate the right to masturbate. The first National Masturbation Day was May 9th, 1995, after sex-positive retailer Good Vibrations declared the day in honour of Surgeon General Jocelyn Elders, who was fired by President Bill Clinton in 1994 for suggesting masturbation be part of the sex education curriculum for students. So when I heard about that, I thought, oh, there's actually a deep cause to that. And I, it made me think about my own sex education and what it would have been like to have masturbation as part of the curriculum. That would have been crazy. I mean, I was at 1994. That was when I was getting my sex education. So in my Catholic school, we had um, one lesson at the end of primary school, which was called growing up. We had to get our parents' consent and I think parents were kind of like thinking, oh, great, we don't have to have that talk with them. They can have this one class for one hour and then we're supposed to know everything there's, there is to know about puberty, periods and sex and where babies come from. And then in high school, there was reproduction in biology, but talking about plants, animals and some human reproduction. And then we also had some education about sex in religious education, which was very much from a Catholic um, standpoint. For example, I remember one of the, le the lessons says, when a husband loves his wife so much, he wants to place his penis inside her vagina. And I used to think that, you know, sex or penetrative sex would result in um, automatic pregnancy. When I saw families that had six kids, I thought they'd had six, they'd had sex six times. And uh, if they only had one, then only once, you know, I, I just had so many questions that were not answered. But I remember one of my teachers who was quite clever, um, even though she was teaching us this kind of very limited view of sexuality from a um, a Catholic lens, she um, told us to write a question on a piece of paper and fold it up and she would collect all the questions and then answer them so it could all be anonymous. I remember my question, actually, this is like so crazy. I asked if um, like pubic hair was supposed to grow at the same time as armpit hair, because at the time I'd grown pubic hair very young. I, I think I was about nine or something, but my armpit hair didn't grow until much later in life. So I was a bit confused about why my armpits were still so smooth, but between my legs was a different story. And um, I can't remember what the answer was, but uh, it was kind of like, I guess, I guess no one really knows. And I guess, um, but I still felt, you know, a sense of embarrassment when my question was, was uh, selected. But these, um, this education that I had, I was very aware that it was limited. I didn't just leave it at that. 
because I was also very curious about sexuality. So I, um, and also I was a very, I was a late developer. So that, that late development, I mean, I only had my first period when I was 14 and a half, which just seemed so late. I was always jealous of my friends who had their, their periods when they were 12, 13, because I really wanted to be an adult. And I think a lot of maybe not all teenagers can relate to that, but I really did want to grow up. I wanted to get my first bra. I mean, I had bee stings until I was about 13. And um, I was still wearing a vest when everyone was getting their first crop tops and bras. Even people who were flat were getting bras because their parents wanted them to be, you know, not have, um, not be left out on this whole experience. I think a lot of people now might not want to wear a bra, but I really wanted one. And I remember getting my first one. I just kept like put, um, lifting up my top and looking at my my tiny tits in the mirror thinking, oh my God, I'm a woman almost. And then when my period started, I remember being really happy about it. Um as it happened finally. Um, but in the time when I was, you know, I learned about periods to the time I had my period, we were given some, um, these free pads and tampons, not tampons, actually just pads from a company. And they had this little booklet all about periods and where they come from and what to expect, etc. And I read that book so many times. So I knew so much about it. And I was thinking, is it coming? I had a little belly ache. I was like, is it coming now? Is it coming now? Um, so I, I knew a lot about it by the time it did um, happen. And also all of the magazines I was reading were very explicit. My mother could not stand all of the magazines I was reading because some of them, I remember there was a magazine that was teaching you how to kiss a guy. <laughs> they had this little book, booklet called The Kiss Kit. And my mom was just so shocked by it. And I think I was only 14, 15 at the time. Um, but yeah, it was very, very funny. So yeah, I was very curious about first kiss you know, touching up my boyfriends, being touched. And um, and then sex, I kind of waited until I was, you know, 16 and a half. But um, I couldn't imagine, masturbation didn't come into my thought patterns until much later. I remember when I was about 17, I really loved um, Tori Amos. And she has a, a song called Icicle, and that's about masturbation and about growing up in a religious household and one of the some of the lyrics are getting off getting up getting off while they're all downstairs sing away he's in my pumpkin pjs and um why should i take from his body when i can take from mine instead and it's such a beautiful song with a beautiful piano in the background and that's when i first realized that masturbation was a beautiful thing but for me at the time i was never really I, although i had a lot of sexual energy going through my body um, I did try masturbation, but it didn't really work for me. Uh, maybe I just didn't know how. I used to have these nocturnal orgasms from a very young age. I used to just wake up and and then just have these clitoral spasms, which were quite intense, and they would wake me up. I didn't remember having any erotic dreams. It was purely a physical response to whatever was happening when I was sleeping. And I used to always sleep with a pillow between my thighs so I could kind of rub against it to kind of make these amazing spasms subside. It was crazy. It used to happen to me until I started using sex toys, actually. I guess I got my clitoral spasms from other methods at that point. But um, it was such a, a crazy discovery. And it, and I didn't really know what was happening to me either. But I think um, it would have been nice to have masturbation on the curriculum, to know about this and to know and to be encouraged to, to explore yourself. Because one thing for me, was that I relied on partners to kind of um, provide me with orgasms, which is great to be able to have an orgasm with someone else. But there were situations in, uh, that I was in that made, I was in maybe toxic situations because I didn't know how to kind of sort myself out, so to speak. And then when I discovered um, sex toys and I could actually give myself pleasure, it had a huge impact on my emotional life. It meant that I stopped choosing toxic partners and I wish I'd known that at a younger age. And I remember when I was interviewed for a Spanish newspaper, I was on the front page of this news, this free newspaper. So it had a huge audience and everyone was reading it on, it was actually, it was um, given away at the underground stops in the morning. So everyone in Barcelona and Madrid was believe, was reading it. And I remember the, the um, title of this interview was, if I had a daughter, I would give her a vibrator at the age of 13 and everyone was thinking, oh my God, this is so scandalous. But I don't think it is scandalous. I think it would have been a good thing to actually explore myself from a very young age. And I would have probably made better emotional decisions later on and not been, you know, dominated by my hormones. You know, I think it would have been a good to know how to handle the, the feeling of sexual arousal 
Yeah, so masturbation on the curriculum, well, for us, it was it was actually something that was sinful, not mentioned at all, because the purpose of sexuality was only procreation. Pleasure was not really a part of it. It was procreation in the situation of marriage only. Yeah, so that was what that was what I was taught, but I rejected it from a very young age because I had two kind of influences. Um, the one was the school family influence, which was very religious, and the other was mainstream media, and that taught me something different entirely. So I was able to make an informed decision about which path I wanted to take, and I was aware that choosing a more liberal one was not sinful at all. In fact, now that I've become quite spiritual, I do find that masturbation is a way to connect with God and the divine and to connect with my body and understand this huge gift of sexuality. And I am so grateful for this gift. Now it's time for this episode's interview. We'll be speaking with Chad Braverman, the COO of Doc Johnson, the world's number one adult toy manufacturer. So Chad, welcome to the Orgasmic Lifestyle Podcast, and thank you so much for taking part in this interview today. Very happy to have you here. And you are the COO of Doc Johnson. For those who are unfamiliar with your work, could you tell us about Doc Johnson, please? Yeah, definitely. Um, We are 47-year-old sex toy company, Mm -hmm. one of the oldest, um, one of the largest U.S. manufacturers of sex toys. Um, but I sort of like hone in on that word manufacturer, because I think the most important thing to know about us and about, you know, Doc Johnson and what we do here is that we are actually manufacturers of product, you know, behind me here, this is my office, but right over to the side of me here is 250,000 square feet of manufacturing facility. So we still make uh, over 60% of all of the products in our catalog, which is about 1,600 items total. We still make about 60% of that product here in Los Angeles. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a process that we've sort of been doing since uh, 1976. Uh, we kind of opened our doors day one as a true manufacturer. And, you know, if this is a place that you ever come to, you will see the product being created from, you know, initial concept all the way through to actual production of the product. So are you also distributing your products or are you just purely based on manufacturing and you have different brands? So our sort of our our main brand is Doc Johnson, you know, that's Mm -hmm. sort of like, that's the company. And then you know, over the last, I would say probably 10 years, uh, maybe a little bit more than that, we've kind of, you know, started these sort of sub brands that I think speak specifically to different categories and different sectors in the market. Doc Johnson as a whole is kind of this really large entity and we manufacture product in almost every category in the industry, um, you know, for every one. And so it's kind of hard to do that and and not sort of like segregate brands, you know, to market those brands specifically towards the clientele that we think we're making that that product for. Mm-hmm. So you're distributing worldwide or basically mostly US? Worldwide, everywhere. Um, US is our largest, but we are do a massive business in Europe and, and Canada, uh, Australia, um, yeah, Doc, you can find Doc Johnson pretty much on every corner of the planet. I first heard about you. Well, I've kind of known you from the, I've seen you around in the sector, um, previously, but I re- I read the book, um, Buzz, the stimulating history of the sex toy by Hal. Ah, sure. I have it right there on my, right there on my little bookshelf. Yeah. I really believe everyone in our sector should read it. This is just so interesting. And I learned some things that yeah. I just couldn't add. a great job. Sorry? I said she did a great job. It was amazing. An incredible book. Yeah. And I was really yeah. surprised about the term marital aid. Is that how you started, that the company started? Uh, with that? Could you tell us? Yeah. About if you look at our 1976 catalog, it is a, a picture of a couple on a beach, like at sunset, 
and uh the front of it just says doc johnson marvel eights okay uh, you know and that's i i People always ask me about the industry or, you know, what the product is. And I said, we went from Merrill Aids to adult novelties to sex toys to uh, sort of, I would say that the, the, the evolution currently right now is pleasure products. That was one of my questions further on, actually, about the language about these products. I think it, it, something else that surprised me about the term marital age uh, from when I read in in Buzz, the stimulating history of the sex toy, was about that they were hollow dildos for married married couples. I just thought that was such a strange. That's not what a lot of people would not think of that. You know, the strap-on dildos being for heterosexual married women. <laughs> it was just oh, the married married um, couples. You know, it's very people think of that maybe more kind of for pegging or for for lesbian sex and. Um, yeah, I think back then, you know, a lot of it was also about, um, I don't want to say like covering up what the mass of the product was about, but I think we were trying to legitim legitimatize the business. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. if you go back, if you go back to the, to the, to the mid seventies, when sort of the, the, uh, the pleasure products category was really starting to evolve, um, and sort of grow out of the magazine, uh, you know, and film and sort of like the peep show uh, sections of like the stores where like stores started to actually create areas for product. Um, you know, it was a, it was an industry that was, was, was highly regulated and it was an industry that was highly targeted by all sides of government. There was not really two sides uh, on this as there are kind of today. Um, this was something where you know, really speaking, the U.S. government was 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 out to, you know, uh, try to take down the adult industry as a whole. Um, and so, you know, sex toys or adult novelties became marital aids to begin with because that sounds like something that people need to, you know, help. Uh, whether it's, you know, their sex life or their marriage or, you know, even more like medically kind of speaking in a way. Yeah, it's interesting. The same kind of stuff is still happening today with um, the terminology. I think people want to move away from the term sex toy. It sounds trivial, but potentially, and the word sex can be problematic in social media. But also there's the words like, for example, pleasure product, as you said, and sexual wellness device. I mean, do you have any favorites or that you, or the, or the, does the company have any? I definitely, I don't want to sit here and like brag and say that I feel like I was like ahead of the curve on that. But I'll say that as someone who grew up in the business, I mean, this is my family's business. So like yeah. I started in this industry before I started in this industry, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think that I had a vision of, or at least an idea of what I thought was going to happen here. And I said early on, even before I started working at the company, like, I don't know why you call them sex toys. It makes it sound um, like lesser than, mm -hmm. you know, like I hear the word toy and I kind of just think cheap. Okay. Um, and so there was this idea of like, well, what else would they be called? Um, and that's kind of where i mean for us it's uh sort of doc johnson american pleasure products you know and pleasure products is definitely sort of like a connotation that i think has been like pretty adapted mm -hmm. um uh on one hand you have to get you away from the word sex but i don't think that to me it's never been more about the sex part of it as much as the toy part of it and i know when i was growing up and i ever heard my 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 dad say like adult novelties to somebody Whenever I said that, I just always felt like that that was led into more questions. People never understood what adult novelties were, <laughs> you know. And then I think the word novelty, in, in some ways, is is I don't want to say it's worse than the word toy, but I think novelty, like the the true definition of it, is like not something to be taken seriously. Mm, and yeah. so, as this industry has grown up and become a lot more serious and the product has become a lot more, or I should say the product has become better and more mainstream. I feel like the terminology surrounding um, the industry has to as well. Definitely, definitely. 
So um, you have over 2,500 products. You're currently selling over 2,500 products. Is that correct? About 100. Yeah, we've scaled, we've scaled down a little bit. We always try to kind of like, you know, always sort of always curating the line, trying to make sure that it's like, even though it's a huge line, we're always trying to make sure that it's, you know, the right amount of products. I would say right now we're probably sitting at about mm, 17, 1600, somewhere between 16 and 1700 products. Wow. And how many brands is that? Uh, I mean, probably over 20 brands without wow. counting exactly. I would say they're, they're, that that's probably throughout 20 major brands. We still have some product that, you know, does really well that I would say is sort of like, sort of like branded on its own. Like it might just be a couple of items that sort of like share the same name, but they were never kind of like built into a big brand. They were never sort of marketed as a brand. They're just kind of like units that kind of stand on their own. Um, and then, and then from there, I would say that there's, there's 20, you know, pretty big brands within the Doc Johnson we're, we've we've started calling it the house of doc oh wow well, so it's cool. kind of like within the house of doc there's 20 brands that you know let's just say that there there's 20 rooms in the house of doc that kind of have their own little uh story what about best-selling products what's your best-selling product and it has it do you have a bestseller over the last few years and it's been that that sells yes yeah, so else? also something that we break down based on category a little bit because we do have so many products and uh you know sometimes i always ask like well are you asking about revenue are you asking about volume um you know there's there's different sort of ways to look at that question um so i kind of give that answer and i say that you know I'll give you like the top five in different categories as well as sort of like a mixture of revenue and volume Okay. One of our biggest brands, uh, one of our biggest brands is uh, a, a brand of ours called Goodhead, which is a line just basically all around, um, you know, uh, personal care and cosmetics for oral sex. Okay. It's just like an oral sex enhancing brand. It's something that I think we do really well that kind of like a corner that Doc Johnson kind of carved out for itself that uh, I don't really think anyone else is kind of playing in that on that corner at all. So, um we have some, some of our top selling items in the whole company come from that Goodhead brand. And then as a brand, I would say it's probably like the number one overall volume brand, but it's a, it's a much more inexpensive line of product. It's all sprays and lotions and potions and things like that. So the price point way lower versus something like our Vaculock sex machine which, you know, retails for over $750, wow. you know, that's one of our top revenue generators in the whole company, but nowhere near the volume of, you know, good head, you know, oral, uh, sex gel. This is like a blowjob simulator or something like this. Uh, the, the good head or the sex yeah. the machine? Both. Good head sounds like so the sex, the, the, I mean, the sex machine is, 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 is a traditional sort of like, you know, uh, like, uh, like a penetration machine okay. that you can apply different attachments onto. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas the, the good headline is, is yeah, it's, uh, lotions and gels and, and different types of, of product, but it's all around enhancing oral play. Okay. So it's flavored or. You know, we have a product in that line called Juicy Head, which activates the salivatory glands. Oh. Um, so it's like, you know, for sloppier blowjobs or wetter head, things like that. Um, and then some products that also do really well for us are um, uh, our Pocket Rocket, which is kind of one of the number one selling vibrators pretty much in the history of the of the industry kind of feel like every woman I've ever talked to said that like a pocket rocket was one of the first items they ever bought. Um, so that's just kind of one of those like sort of beginner items, sort of like it's the sort of like the gateway into like the adult in or into the pleasure products industry. Definitely. I've just been to, um, I was just, uh, at the Aerospain fair. Did you hear of the Aerospain fair? It was like, Aerospain. yeah, I did. 
Yeah, yeah, I was I was hosting was it. it. I was the MC at the gala. It was a fantastic experience to see this because I was living in Barcelona. It was just amazing to have this on my doorstep. And I always go to Eero Fame every year. And I think in general, I, I would I don't know what the percentage would be, but I'd say most sex toys are for female stimulation. I think there's definitely uh, the male sex toy category is growing a lot, as is the the couples one. What, what's your experience on which is the most? Yeah, I think the pen. I think the pendulum swings. I think the pendulum swings a lot. You know, like mm. if you look back at the beginning of the industry, it was not necessarily made for men, but it was definitely men buying okay. products. Mm. You know, and so a lot of stuff was marketed uh, and uh, strictly towards men. You know, and the male buyer, and then obviously that did last for quite a while. But you know, there was a a massive turning point and sort of when the pendulum really swung in the other direction was, um, you know, there was a few tipping points here, right? Obviously the introduction of the internet, um, as e-commerce became bigger, realizing that you could go online and not have to go into a store to buy a, to buy a, a vibrator brought a lot more women to the category, the sort of mainstream tipping points, like, Sex in the city, discussing vibrators, you know, on this massive show, four women sitting around a table discussing their vibrators. Um, that sort of swung the pendulum all the way in the other direction, which was like, women are the only buyer. Everything's for women. You know, 10,000 vibrators every year coming into the market from all these different companies. Um, everything, you know, kind of all about uh, the woman buyer, um, and realizing that that is really where the purchasing power was. Um, and then I think when that happens, you do start to leave gaps in the market, you know, which I, I think one of the gaps in the market was what's a male product outside of a masturbator, you know, it feels like, you know, we were definitely, we're very big in that category. There's a few other companies that are pretty big in that category, but outside of that, what, what are you making for men? You know, and that's when um, I think, you know, people realize like, well, how many vibrators or, or female products can the market bear every year? And, you know, anyone that's, you know, running a good business has to look at where the gaps in the market are. You know, we developed a line probably like six or seven years ago called Optimale, which is a whole line just based solely around men's sexual health and wellness, you know, and it, it's not about sexual orientation it's it's we make product for kind of everybody within this line but everybody male orientated in the sense of you know we're not just going to make a stroker um or like a lubricant in that line for like traditional masturbation purposes we make butt plugs and cock rings and vibrating cock rings and prostate massagers um and uh different personal care and cosmetics um it's a really big so all-encompassing line for men's sexual health and wellness. And we built that line and developed that line really specifically because one day we were going over product and going over sort of the different, you know, development that we wanted to do in the company as we do every year. And, and you know, one of the things that was brought up was like, when's the last time someone built a brand for men? You know, like where's the where is the mail product now? It's just not around. Everything was being solely focused on um on just the female buyer. And then you had companies come out like WeVibe, um, who obviously were focusing on the couples, and that became a different part of the pendulum that swung towards, oh yeah, how do we make product for people to use together? You know, where it's one product that is really for both people, not necessarily you know, a, a pocket rocket that a woman would feel comfortable using in the bedroom with another, with a partner, but how do we make a product for partners, you know, and, 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 and trying to capture, trying to capture that market as well. So what about the app control products? Are you, are you working on that at the moment? Do you have any app controlled products? Uh, we don't at the moment, but it is something that we are, uh, very sort of like in the middle of right now. It's Okay, interesting. That's so, the most yeah. I can say. I, that's okay, the most good. I can say. Hopefully, I'll add really interesting stuff to to divulge in the next 
couple of months. Because I read also that your company just boomed with the um, pandemic. And I think one, a lot of people would assume that was because, you know, also there's a lot of, you know, long distance control. But why do you think people was, why do you think the sector boomed uh, in the, in the pandemic? You know, I think I look at it in, in, I think there's two kind of people that were out there in the pandemic, right? You were either, um, you know, alone, you know, you lived alone or you didn't have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a partner. And, um, you know, we were all kind of locked up and, you know, at some point in time, I mean, I think the numbers back up that most people at this point own boys, you know, and are, are using these products. And so why not get more and explore different, you know, things that you maybe weren't exploring before or didn't have the time to, or weren't looking up online and kind of finding um, and then I think on the flip side of that, you had people that were together and they got locked up together and, uh, maybe pleasure products were not a part of their relationship and they became a part or maybe they were, and they evolved into more categories as well. I don't want to say out of boredom, but like, look, we were all in this like moment. It was like the first time that any of us had gone through anything like this and, we were all doing things that we had never sort of like expected to do, getting into different games, into different TV shows or reading or whatever it was. And I, I think the, the, this industry, um, saw a massive, um, and it wasn't just our company. It was every company just saw a massive explosion. Um, because you had a lot of people locked up looking to have thought, you know, and I think that's what we do. I mean, we, we anyone that's never used a, a, a product before that does or uses a new one in a different category. I mean, sure, I've had people say to me, like, I didn't love that one, but I, I did love this one. It's not like I don't like these things at all. Mm. You know, there's always going to be something out there that's that someone's going to love. And it's going to greatly enhance their sex life, whether it's solo play or with a partner. Definitely. I mean, 2020 was the best year of my career. <laughs> it was incredible. And, uh... Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, podcasting too, right? I mean, and all that. Like, it, I, there's how many podcasts were, were created during the pandemic because that's another thing. People were home listening to this stuff, going on these walks because that's all we could do, mm -hmm. you know, going on two hour walks a day. It's like, what are you going to, you know, what are you going to listen to? Also, I think it's responsible for the the sector becoming more mainstream. That's my next question. So, I read that you have become you mainstream enough for the Los Angeles magazine to call you the Procter and Gamble of sex toys. <laughs> <laughs> I guess everyone knows you. Yeah, has that changed a lot for you, like personally and professionally? Like everyone kind of knows more about what you, what your what your work is about. I think. Well, look. Yeah, I mean. I would say that it's, it's changed the, it's changed the temperature of the conversation. You know, I don't, again, I grew up in this business. I grew up before the internet, you know, my dad did not tell me what he did and he did not tell people who he did not know what he did, especially people at my school. Um, or friends of mine, uh, parents and things like that. This was not an opening, um, uh, dialogue of conversation that was ever had. Um, my dad was an importer exporter. Um, my dad did health and beauty products. Um, I don't know any number of stories, medical devices. Um, there was always a bunch of stories floating around of like what my dad did. And a lot of that was to, um, shield me specifically from any judgment um or to have you know any parents tell their you know their kids like oh well you, you know you can't hang out with chad and you know can't go over to chad's house because it's you know going to be caligula over there um but i don't have that uh benefit if it is a benefit at all i don't know but i don't i don't even have that choice right i mean uh if you just google me um 
you know, you're going to find out what I do. You're going to find the LA magazine. You're going to find the New York times article. Um, you know, and, and we've been very lucky to have it probably 10 times the exposure and, and, um, uh, editorial that any company in this industry has ever had. Um, you know, that New York times article that was written about us, uh, you know, I cannot tell you how big the New York times is. I mean, I didn't know, and I'm, you know, I live here and obviously I know the New York times is the New York times, but when that article came out, I mean, I was getting text messages. I haven't changed my number since high school. I was getting text messages from people I have never spoken to, wow. you know, that just took a chance that my number was still the same number. And they were like, dude, I saw you in the New York times. Like, you know, like, oh my God, like stuff like that. And I getting calls from producers and people that wanted to do reality shows and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that on one hand, I don't have that choice. And then on the other hand, it's okay because people love what I do now. You know, I'm not getting judged. My kids, I don't think my kids are getting judged. I mean, you know, I just went through a whole situation, you know, with my five-year-old, he's starting kindergarten and, you know, we're looking at a lot of schools and, you know, I'm saying like, every one of these schools is going to Google me. You know, mm -hmm. every one of these schools is going to make a decision as to whether or not they're okay with a, with a, with a, someone from the adult industry, you know, being a part of their community. And, uh, no one's going to tell me that they didn't accept my son because of this, you know, but I was genuinely, it's the first time in my life where I was like, okay, I'm a hit at dinner parties, um, of a great, uh, of a great, uh, um, single serving friend on like an airplane, you know, people love finding out what I do. They want to talk to me about it. Uh, you know, people share intimate details with me that I don't think that they would ever share with somebody else, um, because of what I do. And they think like, I'm like sort of a judgment free zone, but this was sort of the first time where I was like, huh, I wonder what's going to happen here, you know? And, uh, I mean, we applied to five different schools and uh my son got into all five. Oh amazing. You know? And it was like I I think he did he is deserving of it, but he's also only five. So it was interesting for me to know that like every single one of those schools Googled me, found out what I did, and accepted us anyways, you know. So I think that was a very cool moment for me knowing sort of where my childhood came from uh and what was kind of hidden from me and 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 then now to know that 35 years later um you know we're in a place where this is very accepted and very mainstream and it's a business absolutely and you know, that's probably what the number one for me personally the thing that i've always felt and why i've been very such a champion of this industry or my company uh, really is that like we're, you know, as a manufacturer, like we're job creators. Definitely. You know, and not just the industry as a whole, which is a massive industry, but like we are job creators ourselves. Like we, we employ 250 people in Los Angeles making product, you know? And so when someone talks to me about whether or not my business is uh, legitimate enough for them. I, I, I want them to show me other companies in LA that are supporting 250 families. Yeah, I mean, that's probably the reaction I get most is probably the people confessing their secrets, <laughs> which is probably not what people expect. They would probably expect there's more judgment, but it's not. If people are judging, they're not really sharing that. But um, speaking of the 250 families that you're supporting, so you actually manufacture most of it in the US. Whereas a lot of companies um, are, are, are producing in China. So why is it important for you to kind of keep control of that manufacturing and do it locally? Um, you know, listen, I can point towards the, 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 the quality control that you mm. can retain by having uh, the process under your roof and under your eye every single day is second to none. It's just, it's not, it's not um not comparable uh, i also think that when you 
when you're hands on with a product, when you really understand how a product is made and how it goes from conception to final in your hand, um, consumer ready, um, I just think it brings a sort of a, there's a knowledge that's gained with that, that you just don't get in other places. And I think there's a level of expertise um, that you that you get by working here and working in this particular way than by making something on your computer and just kind of sending it off to a factory overseas and then just receiving the product in a, in a final package and not really ever touching it. And I don't really want to like speak badly about what anyone else does, but there's a lot of companies in our industry that aren't even designing the product. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just buying stuff that's ready made from China and putting it in a package and, and just selling it. Would you say it's a faster yeah. process as well for you? Oof, I don't know. It could be a much longer process. Our process is super intensive, super labor intensive. And, um, you know, uh, it, it, it's a lot of work to get from A to Z. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's a faster process when we need more product. Like we're, a, I would say that we're as close to a just-in-time manufacturer as you can get. And of course, our MOQs and a lot of the stuff that does affect other companies doesn't affect us, which makes us more nimble. Um, and we are able to turn around product a lot quicker. If I'm out of stock on something, if I have the components needed for it, I can make it for you very, very quickly. Whereas if my competitors are out of stock, they're waiting, you know, 60 to 90 days uh, for more product to be put onto a container and, and shipped over. Absolutely. And also shipping so, was very expensive in the uh, pandemic as well. It's very complicated. Uh, things. I know. I mean, listen, we yeah. still ship a lot of product. I'm not sitting here saying we make a hundred percent of our own product. We don't all of our electronics and, you know, all of our, uh, all of our, um, vibrating product, things like that. They do come, uh, from our factories overseas. And I mean, we dealt with the same logistic nightmares that, that everybody did and containers were seven times the cost that they are normally. But like, I'll tell you that that was another reason why our company, why Doc Johnson, you know, I think probably did a little bit better than the other companies did, even though we all did well, is because mm -hmm. when people were really truly out of stock um, and China was shut down, we were manufacturing product. Me you know, and we were, we were, we were making product. So that was, that is to our benefit. Yes, of, absolutely. Absolutely. But there's two sides to every coin and, and there's the side of of what it takes to really maintain a manufacturing operation versus a warehouse full of just corrugated boxes. Definitely. So going back to the mainstreamness of our industry and how that's developed lately, what do you think about sex toys being sold in supermarkets and more kind of mainstream outlets? Are, are you being sold in, in more kind of not just sex shops, but all more mainstream outlets? Like supermarkets and yeah. I mean, so here in the U.S., it's not supermarkets yet. Um, it's it's not it's not sort of like what we call C stores either, which are like convenience stores. But yeah, I mean, they are being sold in uh, the WalMarts and the Targets and the uh, the Rite Aids and the Walgreens. You know, the world. Do you think it's a good thing for our sector? Do you think it's a good thing? Cause, I mean, um. I guess um, recently I went to a hardware store here in Barcelona. I was going to buy a bikini trimmer, and then suddenly in the same aisle, I saw lots of pro lots of sex toys, and I was really surprised. I thought it was a really cool thing because, you know, it's it's, it's What's getting a bikini trimmer. You know, just for like pubic hair trimmer. <laughs> it's just uh, looking oh, oh, for intimate okay, okay. Uh, grooming device. And and um, anyway, I, I was so surprised to see a lot of sex toys in in this shop, which is like where you would buy like hair dryers and things, and um, I thought it was so impressive and I, I made a reel um, for Instagram. And then to my surprise, a lot of people who own sex shops felt like it was a stab in the back, you know, and I just, I just don't agree with that. I think it's like making it more accessible to someone who's not going to set foot into a sex shop. You know, I think it's making it more available and, and then different people have different ideas of it. And I was recently on a TV debate in the UK on GB News, which is like the British Fox News. It's very right wing. 
And I was on a debate with this woman who just found it very awkward to have those conversations with maybe children in a shop, you know, if you're, because a lot of now in England, a lot of um, like boots chemist and supermarkets, they're selling more and more toys. And I think that's a good thing, sure. but I mean, not everyone's happy about it. So what, what do you think about that? Yeah, well, I mean, not every when it comes to our business, you're not, no one's ever gonna no no issues ever gonna be sort of like universally accepted. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in in um, with our industry in general. I'm a big believer in sort of the rising tide raises all ships philosophy. I think that when you have more exposure and more. Um, mainstreaming of our product that that's better for the industry as a whole and i i think that we we have a small industry that in terms of how many people are actually sort of like in the industry how many organizations and companies the dollar amount that gets thrown around is, is pretty big but the actual industry is pretty tight and pretty small and so i think that you know the same retailers that have these feelings, I, I, I'm, I'm sure are probably the same retailers who also did not like that the internet started selling products either. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I just don't, I think that's a really old way of thinking. Uh, I don't think it's beneficial for the industry as a whole. Um, you know, I had said earlier about the pandemic that if someone had not bought a, a, a product before from our industry that during the pandemic they did. And I, I think that when you buy your first item in this industry, when you when you first come into this in, into this industry, I don't really think you leave. I think we kind of have customers for life. I think I don't, you know, some better than others, but I think that you're gonna you're gonna buy more product, you're gonna buy in different categories, and you're gonna explore this industry. You're not gonna stop buying vibrators or sex toys or butt plugs or any of this stuff, you know, just like overnight. Um, you're going to continue buying it. So if if someone is introduced to this industry via uh, a mainstream store, um, like a supermarket or a Walmart uh, over here, um, for me, I, I think that's that's great because I'll take um, I'll take a customer uh, any way I can get them. Right. I think it's a good thing as well because it's just like reaching more and more people and it makes it just normal like the act of masturbation which is my next question because i think um, when you were um when you filled in the calendly you talked about masturbation and orgasms being part of self-care do you think that's always been the perception or the goal because I, I see that very much so uh, i want to promote kind of orgasms and masturbation as something that's like part of self-love a self-love practice and that it's important to have that it's good for body positivity and just intimacy if you're in a couple is that was that something you you've always believed? Yeah, I mean it's yeah, I mean it's well, you know, if you want to take the pleasure products, I, I said that it kind of ended with pleasure products, but to be honest with you, what you're saying right now is it points to where I'm wrong and or where I misspoke because it really evolved from pleasure product to sexual health and wellness, mm -hmm. and that that is kind of where the industry is right now. Is is you know, we are really promoting the idea that what we do is not just fun. What we do is actually good for you. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's medically now accepted. And, and there has been enough research on this where orgasms and sort of self love, um, or partner love, you know, uh, that actually achieves orgasm is, is, is good for your mind, your body and your spirit. And so there is a big part of what we do now and, and that, you know, is really le legitimately categorized as sexual health and wellness. And that is the furthest thing that you could get from sort of like the toy world, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, I think that's a big part of it for us as well. I mean, a lot of times, one of the other things that we do really well as a company and as a big, big, big part of our business. And again, this is because we are a manufacturer is we do a lot of private labeling. You know, we make a lot of product for other people in this industry. Um, you know, people who want to make, you know, product very specifically for one type of category. And a lot of the things that people come to us with these days are, you know, very centered around sexual health and wellness. Right. 
and really marketing and 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 really creating an atmosphere where uh this isn't just mainstream or accepted but it's 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 sort of even beyond that like this is actually something that your body needs and that you will receive benefit from that's no different than i'm staring at a jar of a powder supplement that i take every day uh you know here on my desk um you know that they've they've marketed to me a hundred reasons why this is good and i've done my research to know that the stuff in here is good and helps me with certain things in my life and 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 that's that's what we're doing as well definitely one one tendency that i've noticed over the years because i've been in this industry for 14 years but prior to that i was uh, also a user um, but I've noticed that the toy envy thing has gone, has reduced a lot. Like, for example, a lot of people would, would say to me, oh, don't, don't your boyfriends feel intimidated or jealous of your toys? Or even men themselves getting kind of feeling intimidated or that it's replacing a person. I think nowadays attitudes have really changed and people are kind of embracing toys as part of, or pro- pleasure products as part of like a healthy relationship. Would you say that's similar did you would you say that you've noticed that as well yeah i mean i think that you know i have a group of guy friends that they grew up with me and they didn't Mm -hmm. you know uh, probably one by one did i get them into using it's not like they were already past even that if they still had the barrier of like oh well i mean i know you make sex toys but like i don't need them in my relationship you know Mm -hmm. anyone that's that's ever happened to me whether it's genuinely guy friends of mine or, or girlfriends of mine that want me to talk to their husbands or their boyfriends or whatever i always say the same thing which is like you have no idea how much easier i am going to make your life and sort of like how much better i am going to make your sex life you know because you know a lot of i think what guys get hung up on is this idea of like replacement or better than Mm -hmm. and you know I always try to sort of reframe it where I'm just like, you know, our, our, what is your goal here? Right. Cause like, is your goal to make sure that your partner, you know, has an orgasm and, and feels as good as possible during this experience? Because like, if that is the goal, and then I think using a product is going to make your life a lot easier. You know, and, 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 and once they sort of understand that and and, and do actually start to use the products, I I think there's, they're never going back. Definitely. You know? Yeah. I mean, cause I I think you can see how much, um, how much better the experience can be. But yeah, I mean, I agree. I think it's, 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 it's a much easier conversation or it's a conversation I have a lot less these days. I, I used to have that conversation a lot where people would tell me like, I want to use my vibrator, but like my boyfriend or, you know, whatever it is. And I don't have that conversation too much anymore. And yeah, I got my first vibrator. Some of my female friends are like, oh, I've got a boyfriend. I don't need that kind of thing. <laughs> you wouldn't really think that now. It's very different. And I think now because the toys are less phallic, I, think, I, th- I do think that influences things because people are kind of, there's more like suc- suction toys or external stimulators. Um, yeah. I, th- I think that makes a difference. Well, there's, just, I mean, everything now is just every shape and size. There's so much beautiful product out there and mm-hmm. stuff that's, you know, so discreet and, and, you know, so easy to use, mm-hmm. you know, and so easy to use in the bedroom. Um, and so many couples toys too, you know, one of our best selling items, uh, you know, when I mentioned that Optimale line is we have a vibrating C ring in that line and that's, that's one of our best selling items, you know, and it's, 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 it's a great, great, great item for a guy, uh, to use. He gets some stimulation for it, but there's also a vibration that the woman, uh, gets to experience as well. Right. A couple of quick questions. I ask everyone, what's the book that changed your life? Do you have a book? Do you read? Oh, God. Or any, any, any time oh. in your life, any a book that you thought, well, to be honest, not as much as I should, and I've mm-hmm. taken to audio books. Okay. 
Um, I've, I've, I've taken to audiobooks because I just, especially with kids, I've realized that, um, I can get the inform. I'm looking for the information or I'm looking for the experience. And, and that's a way that I know that I can sort of like get it in versus if I'm trying to carve out a half hour or an hour for myself, like at the end of the day to like sit down and read a book, um, then, uh, it, it's probably not going to happen. And there was a, a period of time there where I wasn't getting sort of any, uh, books into the brain at all. So I've kind of taken, I've kind of taken to, uh, I've kind of taken to audio books lately. Um, one that I will say changed my life. I'm bad at this. Cause I only think of things in the last like couple of years instead of like maybe something that I read when I was like in high school trying to see if I can get you the title of this book, but it was basically a book that was written. It's about parenthood though. It's just about like a philosophy in terms of like how to raise young babies into toddlers into, you know, functioning adults. And I, it was like, it's a philosophy, sort of like the REI philosophy, mm -hmm. um, the rye philosophy. Uh, it's no bad kid. I think it is, or there's no bad child. Okay. Um, I would say that is, if you're going to ask me that question right this second, yeah, it's No Bad Kids by Janet Lansbury. Um, I, I think that's probably a book that, in terms of the way that I parent, which is one of the most important things that I do, um, kind of changed my outlook or at least formed the foundation for like kind of the type of parent I wanted to be. Amazing. What about which phrase, affirmation, or quote do you live by? Do you have any sayings that you think this is how I live? Oh, God. I don't know. I feel like I'm going to know the answers to all these questions the minute I hang up <laughs> on this uh, on this Zoom. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if there's anything I live by. Okay. So how can people find you? Oh, let's Johnson. see. I mean, yeah, Doc Johnson. Um, we're Doc Johnson USA on Instagram. I want to make sure that's right because, you know, no one will give a Doc Johnson on anything. People like stole our name. Oh, no. So what was the name? What's behind the name then? Is there a story behind the name? Oh, so, I mean, yeah, I think so. I don't know. This is the story that Ron tells. I don't, it's a funny story. I don't know if it's 100% true, but it, I think it might be. Um, when the company was first getting started back to the Merrill leads where, where, where this conversation started, um, Johnson was, um, the, one of the, the second or third most popular surname in the world. And the idea of like doc, sort of like your friendly kind of neighborhood doc, not like Dr. Johnson, mm -hmm. but like this sort of more, um, feeling more comfortable like the doc johnson you know like there was this idea of like this sort of like person that could help and johnson was a very universally recognized name and doc was short for doctor and a little bit more of a friendly approachable way okay. and uh those two those two things got put together and here we are fantastic very interesting. So we'll be checking out your. So yeah, so we're Doc Johnson USA on Instagram, and uh, you can find us at docjohnson.com. And um, I believe we are the original Doc on Twitter. Uh -huh. Okay. I have all this stuff written down somewhere. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. It's been amazing. The book I'm reading now is. Forever by Judy Bloom. I first read this book when I was 11. It was so scandalous. I was in what was known then as a junior four, the last year of primary school. And this book was doing the rounds in my class. I went to a Catholic school, so the concept of sex education was incredibly limited. And we had had one lesson about sex education, and it was called Growing Up. And the emphasis was on puberty and where babies came from. Finally, the mystery was 
resolved, or so it seemed. But of course, this one lesson which we had to get parental consent for actually created more questions than what it answered. We wanted to know about sex and we had so many questions. I remember one of the girls in the class had got the book Forever by Judy Bloom, and everyone was reading it. And this book is incredibly explicit. It's about a couple called Catherine and Michael. They fall in love. And it's about the concept of first love, first sex, and all of the, everything that goes with that, discovery of sexuality. And I always remember the part of the book when the guy Michael calls his penis Ralph. <laughs> Whenever I hear or know someone with that name, I always think back to forever. And I love Judy Bloom in general. She wrote such explicit books. And there's, there are other books that really struck chords with me when I was younger, such as Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, which is about periods. So it was really nice to kind of learn about growing up and sexuality in through and through novels with a woman who really could empathize um, with the young mind, the young inquisitive mind who had all of these questions. I didn't know who to ask because there was no one to ask. I mean, I mean, it was just kind of assumed. I think this this thing of shame is passed to one generation to the next, and you instinct I instinctively knew from a very young age that I wasn't supposed to ask certain questions. That's why I'm very grateful to people like Judy Bloom and also um, those people who were writers and columnists in women's magazines in the 90s. That's where I got my main source of sex education. And it's no surprise that I have taken this, I've chosen this path myself, because I know how important it is to overcome shame and to talk about sexuality and pleasure. And yeah, so um, the, the book Forever, even though I read it with a very, at a very young age, it's still enjoyable when you're older. And I think it's a great way to, um, it's a great book to give to a young person if they want to learn about sex in a fun way, because it can be very embarrassing for people, but it's also fascinating and beautiful, especially as it's talking about losing your, your virginity in a context of first love as well. It's so good. Yeah, so that's it forever. I highly recommend this book if you've not read it already. It's definitely a classic and I'm not surprised it's been a global bestseller and it means it means a lot to a lot of people. So that's it. The book I'm reading now, Forever by Judy Bloom. Now it's time to slow things down as we prepare for this episode's guided affirmations meditation. It's probably not a good idea to listen to this while driving or operating machinery. Instead, take a break from whatever you're doing, get comfortable, take a deep breath and enjoy. I celebrate the act of self-pleasure. I am worthy of pleasure and I enjoy my own body. Masturbation is a normal and healthy part of my sexual expression.
masturbation is an act of self-love. I celebrate the act of self-pleasure. I am worthy of pleasure and I enjoy my own body. find out more about me and my orgasmic lifestyle, visit venusohara.org or follow me on Instagram at instagram.com slash venusohara. Make sure to search for the Orgasmic Lifestyle Podcast by Venus O'Hara in Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts or anywhere else podcasts are found. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Thanks for listening. Have an orgasmic week and make sure every day is a climax.